Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us this evening. We're very excited to have an excellent panel. You could not imagine a better panel of women to discuss a topic that is very important to everybody who's a writer and a viewer of television in the world. So um, I'm just going to start very briefly. I am Dr. Roseanne Welch. I'm the executive director of the Stevens College MFA in TV and screenwriting. We bring people to LA twice a year, and they work with people in the Writers Guild. And then they go home and they write their scripts. And it's a lovely way to get an MFA while you're a woman who doesn't travel far from her home because of obligations. Um, one thing I was going to talk about is the reason that we thought of this panel. So very briefly, when I was assistant in town, I worked on a show that had James Earl Jones and Mad Sinclair playing his wife. And the gentleman writing the show, and we all love gentlemen, they're quite lovely, but every now and then they need a little nudge. And uh, they were kind of ignoring her character and they thought they could because she was the wife. And then she won an Emmy a month into the show being on the air. And they thought, oh no, what do we do with her? And they couldn't figure out, should she remodel the kitchen? Should she you know, go uh, volunteer at the library? And I brought in a magazine for women over 40 and said, maybe you'd like to do some research and figure out what you should do. Uh, and I never forgot that. And I was like 28 when I did that. I'm like, I don't have to be over a certain age to know how I should look up how to write for someone. So we're really excited to be talking about how everyone can write more fully inclusive characters across the age range. So I'm going to start. You all have seen everybody's credits. You know why you're here, because these women are so amazing. And I don't use the word amazing very often, so beware. Uh, but I want to ask everybody to tell us who the women who are over 50 in your life inspired you. Are we talking mothers, grandmothers? Who were they? Were they people you worked with? But name us a couple of people and what did they do? What about their life inspired you? Who would like to start? Uh, I'll jump in. Go for it. Um, you know, my grandmother and my mother were great um, Russian peasant women, basically. You know, they were hardworking. They loved their families. But they weren't good models for me of what it is because they didn't talk about it. Um, honestly, Jane Fonda and Lily Tomlin were the ones who we had many in-depth conversations about what it is to be of a certain age. And they were the ones who really gave us a lot of the inspiration of how to think about it. Well, that's amazing. And that showed up on the show. So beautiful, beautiful. All right, who else? Who's inspired you over that age? You know, I'll, I'll share um, uh, my mother and her sisters, um, you know, a group of, of uh, Southern black women who, of course I knew before they hit their fifties and um, now some of them will admit to being above 50. Um, but I think um, as role models, these were these are women who were just always fully living their lives and um, age didn't stop them from um, doing whatever it was they wanted to do or, or thought they should do. Um, there were other rules that they would follow, you know, a, a very strong sense of decorum and what a lady does, but age wasn't something that um, defined them, particularly my mother who, you know, never acknowledges her age. Like I can't even straight face tell anybody how old I am because I've been told off so many times for saying my age and aging her that, <laughs> you know, and, and then I started trying to lie and then I would mess up and get confused and, and she never gets confused. And so, you know, all of that to say, it's, it's like, you know, for me, I really look at it in a lot of ways, truly it's just a number and in no way will I let it define me. And, and that way, when I approach my characters, I'll never let it define my characters and stop them um, from being women who do whatever it is that they need seek and want to do that's beautiful that's beautiful um well it's funny because you know i am in my 50s i wrote for sex in the city when i was like the exact age as those characters except samantha was 10 years older uh i don't have a huge imagination so basically though I feel like before I had a kid, I could look at a kid and I didn't know if that kid was, you know, three or 11. And I kind of felt that way about older women when I was younger. And now, I mean, I grew up with friends from high school or even, you know, grade school. I still have friends from college. They still look the same to me. And, and I don't mean 
you know, plastic surgery. It's like, we're the exact same people. And now we're in our fifties. And um, I know that probably sounds obvious, but just like, I wouldn't write any differently for me and my friends now as I did ever really, except for I'm trying to be more true to our experience. And the one thing I did kind of realize um, mm -hmm. writing the movie Otherhood was there is kind of this new uh, quarter of life that we, cause we're living longer that we just didn't really think about. So I think it used to seem like you're, going to be you know you're dating and then you're married and maybe you have a kid and then you're kind of empty nesting and retired but before that in between like your kid growing up and and death is now this extra maybe 20 or 25 years that uh and like I was divorced a couple of years ago and like dating again now I have a boyfriend I'm like and I don't think of it like uh, I'm this older lady out there dating <laughs> I mean, <laughs> but it was it was fun to see how different it was but anyway I feel like just not making I mean I just try to relate to and love my characters and I'm probably uh it's easier for me to write kind of what I know and so I've just felt like it seems odd to me to even think it's like older because mm. I don't feel older I agree which yeah who inspired I, you in you movie? know I um I'm I'm not uh in my 50s <clears throat> yet I'm going to get there. Um, hope. Uh, but, you know, in, in writing, you know, hacks, especially, you know, I, for us to be able to authentically write, you know, especially a comedian of a certain age, you know, we felt like we needed to really spend time with and speak to women who have really did go up those ranks at a certain, you know, in, especially in the entertainment industry during a certain era. So, you know, I would say for me, people like Carol Liefer and Susie Essman, um, and Janice Hirsch, who are these, you know, com people who have been writing comedy for a really long time. Um, I've, I've gotten to be able to spend quite a bit of time with. Um, and I, I think not only has it been like interesting to just study their craft and be like, oh, this is how their brains work and how they like write. And, and that's interesting for me, obviously, because I'm writing about comedians who write, but, but also, you know, what it took for them to be successful at, at, at a certain time and you know the roads they paved what they had to endure and because I think especially for people of, of my generation especially women who were like oh well, great they're looking for more writers like we're getting hired more and that's that's great but like to really um understand what it took for the people before me so that I could have those opportunities that that lesson is really so like humbling like I couldn't I would never be able to have this this career and these opportunities if it wasn't for women like them um so for me that's been really eye-opening and inspirational and and you know like humbling and and all of those things because um you know I'm only I stand on the shoulders of giants you know and and that's I think something that has been it's partly you know of course the point of the show as well is for a younger person to to honor and understand what an older person has done for them but but that has been really um really a, a really important part of my life honestly that's so beautiful and it's true we hear so many women at least my generation who got into television who said we did it because rosemarie was on the dick van dyke show and that told you it was a job a woman could have so we yeah. keep moving down the line everyone's you know standing on the next generation which is a beautiful thing that's so funny i just wrote something about that about rosemarie oh, wow. what was it I was asked to write this 200 word thing and, and about um, whose shoulders do you stand on? And, and my answer was Rosemary. Oh, that's so cool. Yay. Yay. Um, all right. So what I love to ask about now is kind of across your whole career, because not always at certain stages, who are the coolest over 50 women you've written? Early days, current days, obviously. Who are the characters you enjoyed writing the most who are in that age range? Well, I'll start with that. Um, I, I think for me, on my most recent show, Family Reunion, um, it was the character of Madeer played by Loretta Devine. And when I started with this, um, with this character, with this show, she wasn't supposed to be as central to the show as she became. Um, and she was, she evolved and, and she evolved because Loretta is such an amazing actress and was game to do a lot of things. And I felt like I got to write 
this older black woman as like a superhero um absolutely larger than life with um talents that were um a little extraordinary and um and it was a lot of fun and um it 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 made me feel like i was paying homage to so many women who uh look like me uh, of a certain age who are not seen and not appreciated in that way um so uh i think this character not just you know it being a woman over 50 but just one of the most fun characters i've gotten to create for sure that's beautiful yeah 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 all right other folks well i um i on the I helped a little bit, just very little bit, when Pam Adlon was first uh, creating her show, Better Things, which I just love. And I love her and I've always loved her. Like she had a minivan that was like pimped out when she's just as a single mom. That show's very autobiographical. And um, she, you know, works very alongside Louis C.K. And really he, I think it took, a, it, it was an interesting thing when he kind of went down because she was afraid she wouldn't be able to keep doing her show and she loved you know loved him and felt bad for that whole thing but um she just realized she could do it without him and that and i think on his show she often shared credit with him and so to see her stepping into her own and trusting her instincts and kind of finding that and being so true to who she was and uh just being willing to like look silly and look vulnerable and everything i just really appreciated how much of herself she was comfortable just you know showing on that and then i would have to say angela bassett who did my movie because i just felt like it's just when she walks in the room she's just like a goddess among uh, <laughs> men and we had a scene where she was supposed to have a makeover and i was like how are we ever gonna do this <laughs> Make, her, make it seem like she wasn't already. <laughs> Have you seen but, her in a but, swimsuit? Jesus. <laughs> I mean, she, but she was so uh, lovely. Like I felt, I sometimes feel, that was my first time directing and I feel intimidated sometimes working with legends like that. Um, but she was really great about telling me like, I want direction, I need direction, don't, you know. And even though she's done amazing and very dramatic roles and this was kind of an every woman, um, she just brought so much love and kindness to the other actors and was just a it was great to get to know her and have her be as as much of a goddess as i thought she was it's good to meet your heroes as long as they live up to being heroes yeah. <laughs> excellent marta lucia um <clears throat> I, I i don't mean to sound like a broken record but but my favorite older characters that i've written are grace and frankie um, because they were so honest about what it was to get older. And they also, um, they, they started their lives over. They were, it was aspirational. Mm -hmm. Um, and they were just fun to write. <laughs> they were so much fun to write. Um, you know, I, as we all do, I have a little bit of me in both characters. Um, and it was just, it was a blast and once we got the stories down it was one of those things where the writing was easy once we really understood the stories because the characters just we understood them and and loved them um so yeah that's that's those are my favorite older women that i've written america's favorite older women as well <laughs> thank you cool cool lucia I mean, you know, the obvious answer is writing for Jean Smart because it's kind of, I could write with my eyes closed and she could make it work. Um, so that obviously, you know, is the, the number one answer for me. Um, you know, it's a character that gets to be funny and sexy and rude and whatever she feels like being and conniving and, and all these things. And I think, you know, she's honestly aspirational for me as a person, even though she, you know, she's a 70 year old woman, but I would also say a character that I have really enjoyed writing is um, our younger character, Ava's mom, um, Nina, uh, played by Jane Addams, um, because she's, there's something about that character that I, <laughs> you can write really um, kind of broad dialogue and yet the character kind of meets it, but also Jane is so 
in her shoes as an actor. She is so like in the moment and so living it that like, it also just feels really real. So that kind of allows you to go write slightly, yeah, jokier jokes and, or, or whatever it is. But also, you know, I think it's the, like, it's not based on my mom, but it's a little bit my mom, little Paul's mom, little Jen's mom, a little bit of other writers' moms. And, and also somebody that like, we really want everybody to love as well. So uh, as well as just being just like a joke machine sometimes, but also has like, you know, especially when she loses her husband, she's really kind of having her own coming of age in season two or, or trying to figure out, you know, who she is and what she wants. So she's just a woman who's really going through it. And uh, that's been really, it's a character that when we start pitching on her, I, I tend to have a lot of ideas for better or worse. Um, oh, can, I also, can I jump in? There was another character yeah. that, that I loved writing who was over 50. We did these five short films about breast cancer and, um, Patricia Clarkson played one of the women with breast cancer and she had a living funeral at which she told many people in her life to go fuck themselves. <laughs> <laughs> Assuming she was dying. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> and then she lived. <laughs> she was, that was really fun to write for. Well, that would be, yes. That's a little Literally. Mark Twainy in the <laughs> female world. That's fun. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Well, Lucia just hit on something. My next question, which is, um, are there stories from your lives, the lives of your mothers or grandmothers, other women around you? Where have you mined the stories you've brought into the life of the current character? Or again, a character in the past that you really, cool story from your life that you brought into the story? Well, when I, yeah. Well, when we write on, on, on Hacks, like, I feel like not not some of the writers are there. We have writers of many different ages, but I think um, I don't know if I have an exact story. But I will say that um, something that we're always trying to mine is like the universal things that sometimes um, when you're not necessarily used to seeing like older women as your protagonists all the time, you say, well, what is a universal story that we tell through the lens of this? older woman that feels relatable, then all of a sudden, no matter who you are, if you're a, a middle-aged man or, or whatever you are, you, you're seeing a relatable experience through the eyes of an older woman. Therefore, you're like, oh, I relate to this older woman. And the more that you do that for anybody, I think the more that you can empathize with the person that you're seeing on screen. I think that's why we've all through media been so used to empathizing with straight white men on um, because that's there are protagonists <laughs> over and over and over. So we are then, of course, starting to see the world through their eyes because we're like, forced to be empathizing with their stories or center, centering them as the, the storytellers. Um, so, so it's interesting, even if I'm, I feel like a lot of us who aren't necessarily that age, we try to take stories of our lives and try to tell it through the way that this older woman would see that similar experience in a way to cultivate empathy for, for, for um, or not just empathy, but just to be able to see the world through the, uh, the lens of that older woman. And so, um, I don't, I didn't come up with a good funny anecdote on that one, but <laughs> there's some generalized, um, you know, approach to, to how, how we do that. And there will be time for other funny anecdotes, I promise. I you. better start thinking. <laughs> <laughs> All right, other folks, stories from your own life, the lives of the women around you that you've brought into the show that really inspired a moment. Um, <clears throat> I, I, you know, there are quite a few of them, honestly, throughout <laughs> the course of my, my career. Um, one that from, um, you know, I was part of a group of six people and two women in the group ended up getting married and, you know, I, I, there were many things, but the one that's sticking out for me right now is, um, I had a yucky divorce after 30 years of marriage and I went into the safe to go get my passport and I found 21 boxes. Each one had some sort of piece of jewelry. And I realized that over the course of time, my ex was giving me like dog biscuits to behave. It was this, you know, 
I'd be in a bad mood and he'd give me something and it was a surprise and it seemed so sweet. And I thought he was, you know, thinking about, no, he just had a safe full of boxes. Wow. So we did that on Grace and Frankie yeah. where she found the boxes and, and it was very important to us that he has a perspective that he can defend. Mm -hmm. Not that I agree with it, believe me. <laughs> but it's Martin believe Sheen, you. so. <laughs> but but we didn't want it to be completely um, make him into a total fool without reasoning behind what he was doing and, and, and motivation. I feel like that's a through line to a lot of uh, the writers you, uh, you have here on our panel is um, there's a lot of empathy and love for the characters regardless of the age and I think it comes comes through and I think what I, what bothers me sometimes when I see like movies about older women when they're kind of the butt of the joke or it's like funny that they're getting drunk at their age or having sex at their age or whatever like I think you have to have a lot of empathy uh, even if you don't, aren't, don't relate to that age exactly. Just love for your characters and even your villains. And um, I think that's something that, that women do well in general. But uh, I have had, I've, I really have mined almost my entire life at this point now that I've worked on so many shows and used so many stories. But uh, I remember on, and I'm just writing a movie now that is, I mean, I've told moth stories that are that are very much about that have my parents in them. But somehow, even though I've mined so much of my life, I really haven't mined my parents in a way. And I'm writing a movie right now that um, has a lot of my parents in it, and it's and it feels very strange to. Um, anyway, my mom keeps reading it. And she goes, "What happens to me? What's going to happen to me yeah. at the end?" <laughs> it was sort of inspired by when I I kind of grew up always um, like. I grew up, my childhood, I spent worrying that my parents would divorce and my adulthood worrying that they wouldn't basically. <laughs> and my dad always threatened and usually on Thanksgiving or something, he'd pull me aside and say like, if I left your mother, would you take care of her financially or something? I have this very like fucked up family. And my dad was always threatening to leave and he's this overweight accountant. It's not like there was a bevy of women waiting for him, but he was always seeming to think there was this better life for him somewhere. So we've been kind of prepared for him to leave. But then when I got divorced, I think I kind of inspired my mom and she almost left my dad so I wrote this movie about if she had and um and that's why she keeps saying what happens to me how does it work out for me, for me? <laughs> but anyway it's been fun like writing pieces of um writing pieces of my parents but when I was on Everybody Loves Raymond that show worked very much like a Norman Lear show where you brought in stories of your brothers and sisters and family and uh definitely for my dad like we always felt we were gonna die in his car. He's a terrible driver. My sister and I were like sure we would one day die while he was driving us. And then when she had kids, there was a point where she had to say like, they don't deserve to die in my dad's car. <laughs> they had nothing to do with it. So we had to have the talk with my dad that he couldn't drive anymore. And it was sort of brought up all these issues of mortality. And that became a Raymond that I thought turned out really well about that. And Sex in the City was just full of stories like that. But one older person, I, I didn't want to say, um, you know, because we didn't really have parents in the first version. I can't believe I have to say that now. In the first version of Sex in the City, they didn't really have parents that we saw. But um, I had had this, I had been single for a long time and I'd had a boyfriend for a while and my housekeeper who I'd had forever, one time she said, what happened to Steve? And I realized like she had been wondering why I broke up. <laughs> And if I was ever going to date again, and she's just kind of wondering, because I never really thought I had to explain to her that we <laughs> And so we ended up having the character of Magda in the first um, Sex in the City, like discover Miranda has a vibrator and tell her that she won't get a man that way. And we decided like to have a stand in for a mom who makes you feel all the insecurities that your mom makes you feel when she's visiting, but have it be this person was kind of a fun way to do it. And that was a fun character to write. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Meg, what are you thinking? Well, it was funny. I mean, of course, mining my own life, um, you know, that's that's where we get our, our some of our best stories. But I I did something, I mined like a fantasy um, where I had um, one of the older ladies, Madeer's sister, uh, who was played by Toma Hopkins. Um, I had her get engaged to a man in his 20s. And not just a man in his 20s, a drop dead gorgeous man in his 20s. 
And of course, you know, um, even before we got to being in front of the camera, I had to deal with an actress whose son was laughing at her. And, you know, as beautiful as Telma is, she was so like, can I do this? Do are people going to think, you know, it's ridiculous? Can, you know, and I'm just like, are you kidding me? Absolutely. I want you to own it in every way possible. Um, and then, you know, in terms of the story, we dealt with a sister, Madeir, who felt like, this man's motives needed to be examined, not because she couldn't didn't believe her sister was worthy of love, but because she felt like I don't know this person, and that's sort of how we unraveled the story, you know. That um, and at the end of the day, this was a man who wasn't a gold digger. He was wealthy in his own right, who had something, a lot of things in common with a beautiful woman of a certain age and was like, I'm going to marry her simply because she's my soulmate. And that felt really good. It's not necessarily uh, uh, the reality in this world. It's certainly not my reality. But <laughs> <laughs> it sure felt good to write it. <laughs> That's Love stories like that. Dorothy Parker was 15 years older than her husband, who was a juvenile uh, lead on Broadway. So that's been done. It's been done. Well, you know, Cher and Madonna certainly uh, opened the doors for all of us to be able to do it. So. <laughs> this is true. This is true. We have a question uh, from the Q&A, actually. Very interesting. Is there a storyline or a character beat that you had to fight to get into one of the programs that you worked on, something you had to convince the executives, or perhaps if you were early in your career, you were a lower level writer, that you had to convince the people above you to let you tell. Um, we had quite a few of them on Friends. The two that stick out are um, the one with the lesbian wedding, um, we had to really, really push for that. And the other one was, it was an episode where Rachel and Monica are fighting over the last condom <laughs> and they both want to have sex. Great episode. Well, there, we were in this weird reactionary period and we were told after we convinced them we should do this episode that it was responsible and it's two women and they're sexual but they're not gonna have sex unless they have a condom we weren't allowed to show the foil pack it could only be in the box i know right it's okay. crazy because no one said because people were just being like they are these days that it was a kind of because I was just remembering there was almost nothing they wouldn't let us do on Sex in the City, but that Magda episode, um, there was a thing where she replaces Miranda's vibrator with this Mary statue and um, and she put like tea around it for Miranda and at the end to sort of show that she's come around. Uh, we did a thing where she put condoms around it, but I think they wouldn't let us do that. It was like, you can't mix condoms and her. That was like where the they drew the line. Why, were, why did they mind about these condoms? Mother Mary does not know what condoms are. I'm sorry. <laughs> How funny. Um, you know, for me, I it's actually quite similar. It's, of course, a, about like, sex stuff, which was on Broad City. Um, we had an episode when, where Abby was going to be pegging her neighbor, which actually they were fine with that. It was just the um, amount of veins on the dildo and also the color <laughs> of the dildo couldn't be at all penis-like. So it had, so I think it ended up being like, like neon green and just like flat or something but the veins were an issue and I remember having to go back and forth with legal or something and the and the props guy you know it's so funny to be like working overtime and like staring at the veins and being like I think this vein's too thick I think someone some lawyer is going to have a problem with this with this vein so that took like days days for us to clear but in the end, it was fine. And I will say I've been really, uh, yeah, very lucky that um, I haven't had any like big story things, uh, but it's always, it's the, it's the, it's the veins that, that kill you. 
the visuals. How funny. Meg, any stories you had to fight for? Things that the studio or network didn't want you to do? You know, I, uh, with the most of my career being on network, um, you know, I think I, there was always a line I knew, you know, I couldn't cross, but I do remember um, there was uh, my first show, Eve, um, the girls were, it was girls weekend, they were being wild girls and they were flashing each other, you know, um, and it, the whole point was going to be, you know, back when you didn't know better. <laughs> <laughs> that, you, that you needed to be careful about flashing yourself, that kind of thing. And it was, it was right in the wake of um, Wardrobe Gate with um, with Janet Jackson mm -hmm. and um, in CBS, uh, Les Moonves was in charge of um, UPN at the time, and it was a big. Thing, pixelating and what we were going to see and at first we weren't going to be able to I think we ultimately were able to but you know it was it was you know women's bodies um you know things that were were not even you know three months before controversial women's bodies on that net those networks for a time there were really off limits um, you know, and, and very much, you know, in the hands of, of men deciding what was going to be appropriate to be seen and not seen. Um, and, you know, now all these years later, and, and of course, even how we even look at the whole situation with, you know, who was at fault and all that have, have like really changed. But um, I remember that being a big deal, like even in editing at first shooting it and then editing and making sure that, um, the guys felt like the women's bodies were blurred enough. <laughs> <laughs> what about what you felt about whether they were blurred or needed? Well, to be blurred? you know, exactly. I mean, the actresses, we, um, first of all, we weren't doing anything that any of my three actresses were uncomfortable with, you know, um, and uh, they were all perfectly fine. We were, it was all very respectful, but it's, it's, it's really weird. It's like, you know, we were all of a sudden back in the fifties um, and, you know, or dare, dare we show a turn of ankle or <laughs> what <have> you? <laughs> um, at that, at that particular juncture. Um, and the truth is, is I laugh about it, but we all know that at any time something similar could happen and the powers that be will then take control again and tell us what is and isn't permissible for a woman to show or to feel, you know, good about exposing. It's it's a big step forward that that we've got intimacy coordinators now. I don't know what took so long. We've had stunt coordinators forever, and it's and now I just worked on this show. Fleshman is in trouble in New York that had a decent amount of sex in it, and um, it was like even I felt. And I've written a lot of shows that have a lot, and I even had a column for a while that was like kind of a sex column that, and they said have no sexual fear. Cindy Shupak is here, and I was like, let's not over. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't write the tagline. But anyway, I've written all that a lot, but I even felt like a teenager when this sex coordinator, like this, the intimacy coordinator, because she would just talk so frankly. It became very, um, very much like a, you do it with the producers and with the you know director and the actors and you talk about now are we going to see his penis or like will he be will he be clothed will we need this will he and how will we touch her and will you feel and it's like all very choreographed so that everybody's comfortable and everybody understands what's going to happen and she'll you know she just uses the words like <laughs> we, for some reason we've all been avoiding but it made it it's made it so much better and it never really should have been up to just some you know, male director or male writer, or, you know, kind of the whim of whoever or the network of what they thought you could see or not see. It's really helpful that it, it's a conversation of what do we want the, what do we want to show? Why are we doing this scene? And then what will serve that? And how will it be funniest? And what can people, you know, what are, what, what are you comfortable with? Exactly, exactly. All right, so here's a thought about the characters that you're able to write now. Are there some things that you sort of promised yourself you're never going to have happen to them? Or what are the things that you're very happy that you were able to create in their lives as characters in the modern world? The only thing I've ever promised myself, and I mean, I, I'm not always the best arbiter of it, is I just always never want it to be cliche. And I'm like, whatever it is, that it, it, as long as I stay away from that, I think they're just, you know, context can can have your character do anything but 
for me, I could, I could say that is the thing that I try to definitely avoid. Um, and what was the second part of the question? <laughs> uh, something you're proud that you're able to have brought out in your character's life. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think right now, at least on Hacks, it's just like the sexiness of a 70 year old woman, I think is something that we're really like, we, we've been doing it and we're going to be doing it more. And we're like really proud of it. And like in a way that isn't objectifying, of course, but is empowering, I think. And, and that's something that we've, we've really enjoyed exploring for sure. Beautiful. Um, now I forgot the first part of the question. <laughs> <laughs> What's something you sort of promised you would never have happened oh. to your female character? And what is something you're happy that you were able to have be in her story? Like I before? promised myself I'd never kill them. <laughs> okay. Um, no, really, that was, that was the thing. They're of a certain age, but we're doing a comedy and that's not a place to go in a comedy. Um, yeah, now the second part. <laughs> Something you'd like to, you're proud that you've been able to bring into the life of your you know, character. One, one of my favorite moments um, in Grace and Frankie was when Grace took off all her makeup yes. and sort of laid herself bare. Um, I, I was very proud of that moment and, and overjoyed that Jane said she would do it. Well, because there aren't a lot of actors who would do that. And that the character was built around having created a beauty empire. Right, right. Very popular. Can I ask a follow-up question? I'm yeah. just curious. So do you feel like you're the not killing, killing someone off because it's a comedy? Do you feel like that's like, because it's like in the end, you just want to like, people are there to laugh and that's kind of the promise of your show is this is a certain tone. And so you're like, I just don't want to go to that world. Or do you feel like, I'm, I'm, I love, I'd love to hear about that a little, like. You know, um, the important thing is that we not kill Grace or Frankie. Yeah, sure. That was what was absolutely crucial. Yeah. Um, you know, we did go to a place where we were suggesting that Robert is on the decline. Mm -hmm. um, but the problem is it's really hard to make the funeral of someone you love funny. For an audience, and I feel like an audience might um, feel cheated. Although I have to say, I I never write towards the audience. I don't know why I even brought it up. Um, <laughs> yeah, so it just always felt that it in our show it would make no sense. Yeah. You know, and look, I look at shows like Mary Tyler Moore, who did the the Chuckles the Clown episode, but we weren't in love with Chuckles the Clown. Right. He was always the butt of a joke. Right. He was the punchline. So you could do that. But you didn't kill Barry or Rhoda. <laughs> That's right. I think I've tried um, not to do something just to check myself that I'm never doing something for just the shock value of it. And even with sex, um, you know, make sure it serves the story and that it's, you know, that just not gratuitous, not gratuitous, not shock value, not just doing it because we can on cable sometimes. Cause I feel like sort of early on on cable, it was almost like people with their new toys, like oh, I can show a boob here and there, like they're just walking by in the background or something. So, uh, you know, definitely having reasons for the things that feel kind of shocking and trying to come from character there. And then um, I, I really appreciated like when we uh, on different shows, I guess the first time we ever did this was talking about the sex in the city. Like it was like when I was on Bonanza, but, um, <laughs> no. but when we were going to have Miranda have a baby, we spent a good day just saying like all the things we didn't want to see that we had seen all the cliches and then like, okay, we don't want to see any of these things. And then what are the things that we haven't seen that we could do or what's a twist on those that we could do. And I feel like that's a good exercise sometimes when you're entering an area that's, you know, well trod just to make sure that you're just to figure out what you don't want to see first. Can I just say something about early cable? Yeah. Um, 
We did Dream On in 1989 and 1990. And the marching orders were from HBO. Every episode had to have things that you couldn't do on network television. Huh. More than just cursing. Hmm. So you're left with sex, nudity, storyline. Um, but that those were our marching orders. Oh, no. mm. yeah. We've seen it all now though, right? <laughs> it is too <hard>. much. <laughs> too funny. So Meg, something you're proud to have brought into a character's life or something you've promised you won't do. You know, it's funny. I don't know that I ever said I will never do X, but I think that, you know, it goes without saying um, in a character that you love that you're never going to, you know, humiliate or degrade um and and in a certain way i mean you know it's fine for them to learn lessons and to have struggles and and things happen but um i think that i always feel like you know i i i, res I have a certain respect um you know for certainly um my heroine my leader and and that um i really wouldn't want to put her in certain certain situations um and the second part, I can't believe I'm about to ask you the second part of the question. <laughs> what you want to do and what you're proud that you've had the chance to do with a female character over 50. Um, I think with that is just to, you know, to have the fun to show some a fully realized or many, you know, fully realized women over 50 who were different from each other, but, um, you know, it got, got to sort of, be truly female and and women without another man telling me you know sort of what women do and what they should do um kind of a thing and and i like the fact that um you know that there was almost always a girlish quality and you know that they never lose that sense of you know i think cindy you talked about it with when you look at your friends from high school you know like who we were then we're not so different doesn't matter, you know, if we're 50 or 75, that there's still an essence of that joy and that um, sweet silliness that that we all have. Um, and I think it's, it, I always love seeing um, women of a certain age behaving badly. I do. <laughs> there should be more encouragement of that. I agree. Excellent, excellent. Um, all right, so let's think a little broadly. How do you feel that the lives of women in that age range of a certain age have changed in your lifetime? What changes have you seen in the difference between, let's say, your grandmother's life and your life? On, on, on camera or just- On camera, on okay. camera. Yeah, I know, with a big world. Right? Well, I mean, I'll start by saying, I was talking with someone the other day and realized that the Golden Girls were actually women in their 50s. I, did, I was like, what? <laughs> There's a meme that goes around showing they're the same age as the women in Sex and the City in the reboot is the ages of Dorothy and everyone. Yeah. Oh my God. Because, you know, we thought they were old. Yeah. That used to be the end. Like that used to be the, the last stop. word sent out. I mean, I don't know if you guys have ever seen the um, your last fuckable year, the Amy Schumer sketch. Yeah. No. Uh, Oh my God, you gotta watch it. It's like okay. the great touch, and it's like you're. It's just like oh, you turn fifty, like you're not. You now have to wear sweaters and big chunky necklaces, and you get to be the aunt or whatever. But it kind of used to be that way for as actresses, and I think actresses used to get bad advice sometimes from their agents, or maybe it was just common knowledge that like at a certain point you shouldn't play the mom too early or then you were done playing the girlfriend or you couldn't have a kid who was too old. And I feel like a lot of that is going away and it, for the better because that's why that age range disappeared. I think it was like <laughs> women who could still play younger wanted to play younger and otherwise you were like go to golden girl. So I feel like there's also such great parts right now for women that age, thank God, like hacks and like there's a, there, Grace and Frankie of all ages, there's, they're centered. They're not just like the wacky grandmother or the wacky mom, they're the center of the show and that just makes me happy. And then, so if, if they were in their fifties, 
look how much further women are allowed to, I mean, I guess we're not showing women in their nineties, right? But- um, Betty White. Well, this is true. And she was always the exception, right? (laughs) Um, But, and, but it's true. Betty White was one of the few, if only that, you know, you got to see and got to see sort of, again, as a fully realized woman who could be sexy or mean or fun or what have you. Um, And I, I think I haven't seen, um, I've heard about Emma Thompson and um, this, I can't think of Leo Gray. Yeah. The great Leo Gray. Yep. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I certainly will be watching. I just, I think that goes so far as to show um, that there's at least an acknowledgement that um, women of a certain age exist and um, have needs and desires and that there are people who want to know about it and be entertained by it and not, you know, as some frat boys might be like, ew, you know, and all of that. Agreed. I'm pulling a question out of the Q&A. Thank you. No, I just saw someone gave me the name. Good luck to you, Rio Grant. Thank you. Oh, there you go. Thank you. Uh, pulling a question out of the Q and A, someone wanted to know if you don't have uh, necessarily women in your life that inspired you to write for this age range, not yourself either. Um, do you have any tips or tricks? How did you research someone older than yourself? Let's say earlier in your career, how, how did you find the stories you found? Well, it's not even. Oh, sorry, go. Ahead. I was just going to say that the stories are different than the characters. Um, and, and the thing with the cat, what, what's important is that you understand their basic mindset. You know, you have to understand how they feel in the world, how they feel about themselves. And I think if you're not of a certain age, um, there are plenty of people to talk to. There are plenty of articles to read. But I think once you hear some of the themes, you can go, oh, I can relate to that. I'm no longer a frat boy. <laughs> you know, and now I'm into a new phase. And the other thing I wanted to say is, you know, th- there was a time when um, 65 was almost dead. At least that's how it looked from the outside looking at characters on television. They were ancient. Mm -hmm. And now they're vibrant and they have lives and they want to have sex and they want to have businesses and they want to be seen. So I think things and, and yes, because of that, I think things have changed enormously. I agree. You think about it, Edith Bunker was the representation of a woman in her early 60s, 50 years ago. And she was wearing the knee-high things and the orthopedic shoes and the house dressy thing that had no shape. And and that was her. I mean, I think part of it too, though, is not just imagining that you need to write about that age, really, or it doesn't have to be about menopause or issues having to do with age. It's really... um, more of a like that you've lived and I think Hex is a good example of just the experience and what, you know, who, who, what struggles you had and where you are now and your relationship, what that means for your relationship with your friends and your kids. And um, it's not age related so much as like just the years and the things you've been through. Experience. Um, yeah, experiences and maybe several marriages or, you know, what it's like to get out there again, but, um, I feel like sometimes there's a reliance on the kind of cliches about getting older that aren't, that isn't the story gold area. It's funny to think about though, because I feel like I've written for a lot of different characters and men and women and all different ages. Like when I worked on Raymond, we had like the older characters and the kids and the, I wasn't married yet at the time. And, um, I, I don't know. I never think about it. Like you, I remember hearing on, on Seinfeld, that they finally realized like they could just give Elaine the same stories they gave the guys. And sometimes I think like the same way, like for older women, maybe just think about like, what would be a great story you want to tell? And then what would it be like to tell through her eyes, like filter the story through the character after you have a great story. Don't think like what would happen to an older woman. Agreed. Um, I want to say agreed. Although I will say sometimes the specificity with, 
a lived experience. Like I, and I keep thinking when I look at Marta about Grace and Frankie not being able to get off that damn curb. Um, <laughs> and, and honestly, it's not something I, it's not my point of reference yet. Um, but that thing, it was so damn funny. And, you know, I mean, so it's, it's, if you don't, if you haven't lived it and, and don't know it, I mean, it, I research it like hell um, and talk to people and, and to, to sort of get to, you know, jewels like that experiences and moments that, that you'll remember that people will remember. Thank exactly. you. You're so welcome. I mean, I still, I just, I mean, just being like, this is hysterical. <laughs> it's true. Well, and Lucia, Lucia hit on that earlier when she said going and talking to the older women who'd been comic stand up comics, that that's a world you have to learn about because it's not something. So how are you going to know what are the details of all of that? Can you tell us a fun story from that research that you've definitely used in hacks or plan to, or not um, plan to, but have? <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, quite quite kind of directly, there was a, an experience that Janice Hirsch had had, and she spoke publicly about this. So I, I feel like it's okay. If I, I adore Janice Hirsch and she's shameless. Yes, she's the best. Um, where she she was writing um, on, I believe, the Gary Shandling show, and one of the writers put his flaccid penis on her shoulder, and while they were writing as a joke, and she said some joke back because she was used to you know getting back with a joke or whatever, and then a couple of days this story, this part of the story is, is not exactly what we use, but I'll get to that. Um, but uh, she was brought into her boss's office and they said, hey, we want to talk to you about that incident. And she thought, oh, good. Somebody finally, you know, this guy's going to get in trouble. But then she got fired for it for no, for no reason, um, simply because they were like, oh, what if she does say something or whatever reason? And she's like, you know, that's just what it was like then. And that's, that's the experience I had. And, and we used a story that story really to to inspire the story of when Deborah Vance goes back to an old comedy club and hangs out with an old uh, friend of hers, and they're talking about the club owner and how you know he would you know like make sure to make sure they wore skirts so he could look up their dresses when they were on stage and and you know like they have to sit on his lap to get their checks and and things like that and so that and you know then of course Deborah and her friend are laughing about this and saying oh god that was so crazy what a creep and Ava the younger comedian is is really disturbed by this and she's like that is so fucked up that's like not really funny and like why didn't you do something about it and and you know then of course they have a generational class clash of Deborah being like that's just the way it was like I couldn't do anything about it and then Ava's like, well, you then you got famous, so you could have done something about it. She accused her of being a ladder puller. So it really was just the big, t the tugging of the yarn it was a real experience that, that Janice had had. Um, and again, that was not an experience I had ever, had ever had, but because um, I've only worked for women my entire life, thank God. But, uh, you know, it was, it was a, a, a story that inspired an episode for sure. That's exactly the kind of stuff people are asking about, people are interested in, those connections that people make between their writing life, their research, and how does that create itself into a story that they recognize on screen? So that's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have, I don't think it's funny. I think it's serious. But someone has asked, you know, can you name a male writer that you think has done a good job writing female characters over 50? Mm. You know, um, I would say... A most of the men in my writer's room, you know, once everybody gets on the same page, um, it just doesn't matter anymore. Mm -hmm. And we had all these men who were fantastic at writing older women and older men and younger people. Mm -hmm. So but they're writers. I, I would get they're writers, they're writers, <laughs> and, and they were willing to throw themselves into this world without judgment. Beautiful. Heard that phrase, and I've heard Meg mention respect for characters earlier. We're hearing all the reasons that we don't have cliched characters in the shows that we're talking about right now. So that's beautiful. Um, well, my, my husband, Paul W. Downs, 
um, and I created the show together along with our friend Jen Statsky. And so, I mean, I would obviously have to say him because he <laughs> writes for an older woman all the time and uh, does it very, very, very well. And also, um, you know, he's always written for not what he is, you know, in Broad City, he was the only male in the room and he was there the whole time. And um, I think he's kind of, he, he will, he has gone to the press to say that uh, women are funnier than men. So I think any guy that wants to make that a public announcement, uh, pretty good in my book. But, um, <laughs> but, you know, he also has said, you know, I am a gender trader. He's like, I, I just would rather be with women and be writing for women. And he just, I should marry him. And I did marry yeah. him. <laughs> And then, not only did I do that, then I made a tiny Paul because we just had a baby and we named him Paul because I said, I think I need more of this guy in the world. So um, yeah, anyways, that's my answer. When, when, when my daughter was in um, first grade, um, she used to come to the writer's room after school sometimes. And she announced that women are funnier and they smell better. <laughs> Both true. Both true. So funny. Cindy, Meg, a gentleman you can think of who's really good at writing women over 50? I just think I'm drawing a blank. I think that there's probably <laughs> been um, a number of shows that I've enjoyed deeply and, you know, later found out, you know, they were run by men. And I mean, I, I, I kind of go to the showrunner um, in terms of like, you know, because that's the person's voice most used most often that's everybody's filtered through, but I'm just drawing a blank right now as to one specific guy to throw out there. Sorry. That's fine. That's fine. I mean, I've worked with some great guys. I loved writing with Michael Patrick King and I, uh, and Phil Rosenthal who created Everybody Loves Raymond and a lot of the guys on that show. I mean, they all, I think they all loved their mothers and a lot of them actually were in good marriages and like liked their wives and they were just good guys. I think good guys can write good women. <laughs> I'm just going to make that statement right now um, because uh, it just takes a like kind of a love for them, like like we were saying. And um, I work with Dave Flabot, who is just kind of a gem of a guy and he's a little bit crusty and he's a Boston guy, but he worked, I did um, a show about comics called I'm Dying Up Here with him and he wrote just really tough women. Like it was kind of fun the way he wrote women, like he loved them but he also wasn't afraid to like let them have edges because I do think that earlier in my career, like I worked on coach and I remember like we had a female character kind of like you're describing that. Um, she just always was the nice centered one. She didn't get as interesting stories cause she was like supposed to be, he was the buffoon and she was just the long suffering wife. And, um, and I feel like those guys thought they were doing a favor writing this woman to be the good character, but there was just nothing fun or interesting about it. So I think men that can write flawed women um, and love them anyway is, is kind of like my favorite kind. Perfect. You know, I figured we need to say something nice about the guys when I saw the question pop up. Oh, yeah. Let's have a moment here. Paul Feig is good. Yeah. yeah. Oh, good call. Amen. Good call. Yay. Uh, another question that came up was, um, having been women in the room across different eras of writing, was there ever a time that you had to fight for a story because you couldn't get it past, you know, the, the male voices above you just didn't get it, didn't like it, didn't think it would happen? Plenty of, I, I think for me, there were, were plenty of times, um, whether it was a story or um, every now and then, you know, something that I just found to be completely and utterly disrespectful and, you know, um, I, I remember um, one time, I, I almost quit um, uh, because they wanted to use, um, it was supposed to be a romantic moment between two of the characters on a show called Malcolm and Eddie. And um, it was supposed to be a romantic moment and he turns on the, um, on the stereo and a song plays and it's really discordant and awful and it ruins the moment and they wanted to play two live crews um one of their I can't remember which one but basically the first um line in the song is spread your legs bitch um and <laughs> so you know we, they were going to cut it off right before spread your legs bitch but I was just like I can't do this I can't I can't sit here I can't be a part of this um and you know 
uh, I, I just had to let the world know that if, if they were going to do this, that I wasn't going to be a part of that. Um, and I've been in that situation a few times with, you know, guys and they just, oh, it's funny, you know, and it may well be, but, you know, there, we all have our lines that we're going to, you know, draw in the sand and say, I'm not doing that. Um, yeah, I, I agree with you, Meg, that, that more often than not, it's stories that I'm fighting to not be included. Um, when guys come up with these, you know, anyway, but um, when we were doing the pilot of Friends, um, there was a storyline that was actually based on my life about Monica sleeping with a man who lied to her and told her that he hadn't slept with a woman for two years. Oh, there go the dogs. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, and that's why she slept with him, but she really liked him, but he fed her a line. And the head of NBC, hey guys, <laughs> the head of, N thank you. <laughs> the head of NBC basically said, she got what she had coming because she slept with the guy on his, on the first date. <laughs> oh my God. Wow. Fire came out of my nose. And they actually gave out like a, a, um, a questionnaire to the, the test audiences. And one of them was for sleeping with a guy on a first date is Monica a a slut b a whore c an easy woman d none of the above and and people for the most part thank god said none of the above um so yeah that was I, we had to fight for that storyline we had to fight for that storyline and and we actually um in in trying to acknowledge his discomfort we just touched on the idea that she cared about him. It wasn't just for the sex, but that she cared. And that seemed to make a difference. Because women can't just have sex. We, we're not allowed to just fuck. <laughs> we don't do that. At least not then. Now we're no. allowed. <laughs> that well, is for sure. You're allowing yourselves, that's why. Right. <laughs> You know, speaking of someone wrote Kim Cattrall's character was groundbreaking. I think when I first started writing that show, it took me a while to break the habit of writing women being self-deprecating. I was used to that being like what, where my humor came from and kind of like, um, and they didn't do that, those characters on that show. And I was like, it, it took me a while. Like, I think the first show I wrote was, um, it was like, it was the chicken dance and it was based on all those things that happened to me that I was supposed to read a poem at someone's wedding. They got engaged at my house that I bought and I was supposed to get proposed to there. <laughs> Instead, these house sitters of mine got engaged there. And then they had me do a poem at their wedding and blah, blah. Anyway, I, um, I, I think, uh, oh my God, I totally forgot my train of thought now. Why did I bring that up? Kim Cattrall. Oh yeah. So the, uh, my, I would say I had written, that was the first thing I ever wrote for them. And I kind of pitched the whole story. And then I had at the end that like the bouquet gets thrown and Carrie, cause she's had this bad thing with big, she reaches for it. Um, and then it goes to black and it, it was going to be like, but I didn't, you know, I didn't catch it, but I tried. And they were like, and then, 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 and then it became like the bouquet gets thrown and it just lands at their feet. And they're like, okay. And it was so much better. And it was just kind of unlearning everything I'd been taught as a woman that I was supposed to want and was supposed to be the golden key. And I was self-deprecating and sex is, you know, cannot be just for fun. And it was like, kind of, I had to unlearn along with, uh, along with the audience. Did you? Like that I've you? never, I've only worked for women. So I've really had a really lucky time, <laughs> to be honest. God, I'm very, very, very lucky. Well, you're, uh, you're a, a harbinger of the new world. There was a, it was tough. I, uh, I worked on Modern Family and that was like a tough writer's room for women. Well known as that, like they kind of would have a woman for a year and then, and uh, it was a tough room because it was like, it was, they weren't really into hearing your personal stories unless you already had it kind of 
melt molded into a not like anybody wants to hear along but usually the good stuff to me comes from something some mm -hmm. kernel of truth but uh it was more like joke driven and hard to get in and, I, and then I found myself because it was a tough room like not having as many ideas and kind of shutting down and so I feel like a lot of women's stories in that kind of atmosphere and it used to be more common to be like the only woman in a mostly male writer's room you just lost a lot of great stories that way so I'm glad that it's starting to even out finally that's we had an truth. experience I'm sorry go ahead no, I was that's a sad truth so many stories that were lost and now you guys are able to mine those stories and bring them forward which is what we're talking about tonight so I'm excited to see that change go ahead Mike. I'm going to skip my story no why well I was just going to say um there was a, a in the friends writers room one year it was it, it was um we'd all been together a long time and there there were times that the guys would do stupid things like you know when they were signing something right masturbator and stuff like that but this one time um it was a very late night early morning and i was not there it was just a group of guys and howard stern had been saying nice things about friends and they called in and Howard Stern said to ask them, the women writers, they don't really write, right? They just get coffee and type and the guys go, oh yeah, 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 that's what they do. Oh, <laughs> boy, was there trouble. I actually made all the guys who were on the phone call send apology letters to every woman who'd ever written on Friends. <laughs> and it's just Howard Stern didn't read them over the radio. Yeah. Jeez. Jeez. Wow. Wow. Yeah, well, that's that's the question. Um, all right, we have a question. Uh, I, tr I, I try to avoid business questions. We don't want to ask people how they got their agent and those kinds of boring things. But this one is kind of an interesting one in that, do you think, have you seen evidence that because you have had women over 50 in your shows, does there seem to be more appetites through the streamers or the networks to have shows involving women of this certain age? Have you seen that coming forward? I will say, I think that Grace and Frankie being a success, I think opened the door for hacks to exist. I'm not sure the show, I feel like there was a, a sense that people were really excited about, about that. And it was, I, I, I think that that's true. Thank you. That's great to hear. I, because I wouldn't say they're clamoring. Mm -hmm. like, you know, you, you, every now and then, it seems like every year, everybody's what's the next golden girls or whatever, but I, <laughs> it, it and some of that might be talent driven and, you know, because of the way the industry is and everything, but um, I, I don't think it, I still don't think it's easy for a show, you know, if it's going to lead, a, um, you know, a woman over the age of 50, I don't think it's an easy thing to sell, you know. A lot of the, a lot of the problem is that there's still the old guard of a very older white male people at the top making the decisions and they don't think this is going to be that entertaining or funny <laughs> and yeah. so selling it is sometimes hard but I will say I feel like because of the streamers um a lot of these theories about what people would watch and who they would watch and what if women would watch and if men I mean all that went out the window because like now there's just such a plethora of like when now people are watching stuff with subtitles and we're watching Dutch shows and you know Korean shows and about, there's so much out there for everybody and I think the streamers business model is they want new people so they actually want you to do something that doesn't exist whereas broadcasting for so long is like can you you know program for our same 18 to 35 year old men so i think it's kind of an exciting time for all sorts of diverse voices including older women but you know every, everybody but yeah at a network it's still easier to sell a show about like 35 year old guy who was a bowler <laughs> <laughs> you know that's anymore. literally a show that's coming out Yes. <laughs> okay. That show is another one because wasn't there one last season? There's always one. <laughs> <laughs> no, that show came out because I had done a pilot at the network. Like I'm so Lucy in the football. Like I'll never do that again. Then I do. But I worked with Sarah <laughs> Cooper, who did the Trump um, lip sync, and she wrote a book called How to Be Successful Without Hurting Men's Feelings that yes. we adapted and we filmed, and it was so fun and good. I really loved this show, and it was just like. A really fun show and then of course like the male executives are like nah we our feelings are hurt i don't know 
why do we ever think we're gonna be able to and then they put on a show about a bowler i'm not saying my show was perfect but it was just like every once we go this is not gonna go i did it well, well let me say this your show may not be perfect but they're asking for a show like your show right now yeah, always ask. They're like, have you heard about this show because we want a show like that <laughs> <laughs> you had it <laughs> we passed on it we want to pass we want a new one to pass on it's the golden age of rejection i did notice that because when it did so <laughs> I mean, as much as it's a lot of television outlets, there's also so many places to get rejected. Right? Yeah. <laughs> we were getting rejected, like, is IMDb TV even a thing? And now they don't want our show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the business has changed. This is for sure. And, okay, we, we have about 20 minutes left. And I always like to get it really a little more nitty gritty into the sort of writing in general, you know, aside just from the topic. And so I'd like to ask writers, if you find a theme in your work, a, a message that you seem to sort of keep embedding in what you're doing, kind of what's, well, why do you write? What is it you're trying to say to the world? What do you want to, how do you want the world to be? What's your theme? Not your astrology sign. <laughs> I mean, I think it's like, Probably, yeah, I guess I'd say complicated women, just the complication of a woman, how many things we're carrying at once. And and I think that's something that we tried to do very much on Broad City is just have these girls be like, they smoke weed, they're trying to make rent, they are trying to get laid, they're sweet, they're mean, they're all those things. And I think um, same with I'm this two-hander that I work on now, which is just like, they're very complicated. Sometimes you love them. Sometimes you hate them. They're slowly striving to get to be better people. I, I forget who it was. Oh, maybe it was, I think it was um, Jesse Armstrong on Succession said people don't change. And that's like the thesis of, of Succession, which is interesting because I guess I'm like, now I know how it ends, I guess. But um, <laughs> true. Uh, but I guess I think our our I, our feelings that people can change if they if they want and um yeah so i don't know that's the end of this sentence i think <laughs> that people can change are striving to be better people but they're certainly not there yet one step forward two steps back is really interesting to me um yeah um for me i feel like um my shows are like comfort food mm -hmm. Um, they are, we aspire to have characters that you want to hang out with and they're warm and they're real. Um, so I think that is a theme in what I do or, a not a theme, but, but it is definitely something that connects the stuff I do. Then Meg. I mean, I, I'll just say all of that. And of course, um, for me, always, you know, humanizing and, um, you know, reflecting a black female point of view um, and making sure that when I have, you know, um, the opportunity to write black female characters that they are characters that, you know, I feel good about and and proud of and wanna know and, and are just as, complicated and and um uh you know interesting and flawed as as any character that you would want um and, and not sort of just put in the box of you know the judge <laughs> or the the wise friend or what have you so. i guess i would say like humor and heart for me like i i mean i've also written a lot of essays and told a lot of personal stories and uh, I kind of thrive on trying to be just kind of brutally honest and talk about something that I think like infertility or uh, even marriage to try to write about marriage as I did about dating, try to be honest about things that people aren't always honest about and figure out how to do it in the same way. But I will say at least like Broad City was groundbreaking because in so many ways and so fun, but it was, it, I do feel like it's a newer trend to be able to have women that are are that flawed and complicated and still so lovable. And like all the things you said, like I remember at networks when you're pitching shows, it used to be like, but aren't we supposed to like her? And isn't she supposed to be good at her job? And you know, all these things are like, why? Why do they have to be all those things? But I think we bought into it for a while. So it's really fun to see how complicated female characters have 
are able to be now and still love them. And I think it must be great for a younger generation not to feel like you can't see yourself and that you can still have all this good stuff. But anyway, yeah, I guess extraordinary, ordinary and um, humor and heart. Alliterative, love the alliterative. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Um, interesting question, somebody just popped up. Is there any story that you would like to delve into that you haven't yet? Any aspect of a character's life? Any Anything you haven't had the chance to write yet? I really like magical realism. I mean, I'm trying to do a little bit of that in my movie, but I like all the, um, like the Latino writers that do magical realism, like, you know, like Water for Chocolate and, um, hundred years of solitude and and some and in some ways some movies do that really well and i'd like to be able to do something more like that like one of my favorite movies is truly madly deeply which is just such a beautiful simple movie and i kind of always want to write something about that like that has like a little bit of afterlife or a little bit of something magical um there are a million stories i'd like to tell <laughs> but I have a thing for sci-fi, um, particularly science fiction that reflects some element of our society, not just the like being in a spaceship stuff, um, but but the deeper ones that are about humanity and not just aliens killing people. Um, so that is that is something I really want to do before the end of my career. I'd love to see that. <laughs> <laughs> women, really there's a lot of room for women in that area. Like yeah. we haven't mm -hmm. gotten to do that as much. And that's like a fun thing. Fun. It could be. A fun. I still want to recreate. Remember that movie about like, I think Jennifer Aniston was in it where she's dating the devil, but it was like kind of a horror movie. Meet Joe Black, maybe. But I always thought it should be a comedy. Like, you know, like, <laughs> you know, like he's a good guy, even though. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like that Jack Nicholson movie with um who's that movie? I can look it up. Keep going. Look up. <laughs> was it which is a no? Was he yeah, which which is of Eastwick? Is, okay. Oh, that's, that's right. Great. That's a great movie. Yeah. <laughs> Meg was an area you haven't delved into yet. You know, I I've only dipped the toe. My I'd love to do um something more dramatic. You know, um, in a way, I guess that if I can, I mean, I can't help, you know, my point of view is generally um, pretty comedic, um, but I feel like um, I'd love to do it simply partially because they just won't let me. Um, and so that that's sort of, I think, you know, it, and it's not like I haven't done it, but I mean, do it for hire is what I would like to do. <laughs> You know, I've been, I don't, I don't have any ideas. So if anybody has one, let me know. <laughs> the, um, where I'm trying to like. You do romance. No, <laughs> well, sure. I'd love to do that. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, I've been trying to like figure out some way to like, I'm like trying to make it, figure out a way to make like the decaying environment the as like the protagonist in something. I'm like, how can we make a story where like, the earth is embodied in some person and she is being abused and she's screaming out for help and like creating floods and all these things. And yet like, no, everyone's like, it'll be fine. Someone will figure it out. And I'm just like, there's some, there's some that somebody sent me, that's what magical realism. Okay, well, I guess I'm just not that good at that stuff. But um, I did love Station 11. I did love Station 11, but I don't know. There's something that's like, maybe it's like a kid's movie. I don't know, so, something that like, like she's uh, like mother nature, but she's yeah. less. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Something where it is, you know, <laughs> I clearly haven't um thought about it um quite right <laughs> but something like that. Well, this is not a pitch. This is just kind of what our areas you haven't gone to and had the chance to. So you're good. There's a I mean, an animation for sure. Like that's definitely on my bucket list because I love all the Pixar movies and I mean watch with your kid and you see they are so formative. And because I like heart along with my humor, and you have to kind of hide that hide the ball of that usually on TV. I think there's something nice about uh, how you can have that in children's movies. Yeah. Very cool. 
Uh, another question that popped up was, is there a time that you were able to tell a story on screen that you saw somehow the power of it reflected in the real world, whether that's through a fan letter, whether that was something in the news, whether you just changed some attitude somewhere? I mean, being, I didn't, I can't take credit for it, but just being a part of Modern Family, like I do feel like that, that gay couple was like one of the, that finally broke through. And um, in fact, I just went to a wedding alone recently and I was like, where's my gay best friend? Like, cause it was really <laughs> lonely. And I was like, oh, I guess gay men have now moved on. Like they have their own storylines. They're not our best friend anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and in Modern Family, those guys, like they, that was their, their, their storyline. They weren't anybody's just funny gay brother. And um, I think that like opened up a lot of hearts for that. You know, I'll say like Marta, um, a lot of my comedy um, and certainly family reunion is comfort food. Um, and it came out in a time with the pandemic and everything. And I got, um, you know, just a ton of love. Um, uh, you know, from people feeling like it, it was and kids and, you know, even adults talking about just like it was family for them to like show up and to watch the show. And it, it is very gratifying, um, you know, when you know that that you're touching people and um, it's it's like what makes our work kind of without sounding, you know, precious, important. Um, and, you know, you just never know the joy. Um, I. I, and I say this simply because I get so much joy from watching TV and movies. And so, you know, you just never, you don't always get to meet your audience or hear from your audience. Um, sometimes you do, um, but I think that what we do can be so far reaching in terms of like touching people. And, and it's, it's definitely, I feel like, you know, I've earned my way into heaven personally, but you know, <laughs> I'll be pitching to God. Look, I make people laugh. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful. Thanks. Marta? What was the question? <laughs> was there a time you saw a story that you put out of the world had really affected people in some way? Do you fan mail? You way? know, uh, uh, um, I, I, I think one of the craziest things um, that friends did that we never expected was a lot of people learned English watching friends, particularly baseball players <laughs> for some reason. Oh, great. That was one of those, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a storyline. And I think there were some that definitely affected people. And, you know, we got fan mail and, and Grace and Frankie, people talked about how inspired, but, but this was the one that really threw me. <laughs> That's funny. I can buy it though, because I used to learn Spanish with the telenovelas. So when you love something and you're like, oh my God, I'm totally into it. What are they saying? Let me translate it. Let me figure it out. So. <laughs> Very cool. All right. This is my general last question because I always think it's important for the people listening. We have a mix of, of looking at the names coming through and some folks are, you know, hardcore WGA people, very interested in hearing from all of you. And some are clearly fans. Some are telling me that they're, you know, first time writers or getting started writing. So I always like to ask people, when in your life did you know you were a storyteller? And sort of how did you get through all the obstacles that were probably keeping you from thinking this was a good idea to pursue? <laughs> I knew young. Um, I, I, I literally have... Um, little books that are, I had a teacher who bound them. Um, and, and my mother saved stories from kindergarten and first grade. Um, you know, but I think at that time, you know, you think, oh, I'm going to be a writer, I'm going to write books. Um, and, you know, then sometime in college, I got the bright idea that, yeah, I wanted to be a TV writer. Um, and, and I was lucky enough to have people around me who didn't think that was impossible or if they did they didn't say it to me um you know and and so for that I'm I'm really grateful because I I just don't know what I would do if I wasn't doing this <laughs> um I'm still trying to get there <laughs> there there are many days that I say to myself you, what you you don't know how to do this <laughs> um 
I actually had an English teacher in 12th grade, an AP English teacher who wrote on a paper of mine that I was the least perceptive student she'd ever had and I'd never be a writer. <laughs> and yeah. have, you, have you talked to her since? Yeah. <laughs> um, honestly, and I don't know how you other women feel about this, I definitely have imposter syndrome. Yeah. Wow. I mean, I'm not saying, wow, that I don't, that you do. I'm just like, you have imposter syndrome. <laughs> that's <laughs> I my that's my almost my anxiety dreams almost every night I like I have anxiety dreams almost every night that I can't get where I'm going or supposed to be somewhere but oh, yeah, I think yeah. imposter syndrome is a good quality for a writer like I'm always a little bit um a little bit worried about people who tell me like you gotta read my script it's so great and it's like really because I don't usually think that of my own time. <laughs> I've been doing this a long time I never I'm sure so yeah I think it's an important things yeah. have those voices in your head like in that in um Natalie Goldberg's and uh I mean in Bird by Bird it's all about like, the banshees in, in your head right oh my god so yeah I think that's important <laughs> very good but what about you when did you know you were a storyteller well I did have a teacher in like third grade kind of like Meg who encouraged me not just she called me a writer and there was something I loved about the idea of writer, not just like she liked my writing or I was good at writing, but like you're a writer. And I just took on that identity because I wasn't really, I grew up in Oklahoma, and, but it did take a while to find the right kind of writing. And I'm glad I didn't decide when I was a terrible journalist or all the other things that I thought maybe I should be doing or advertising that I wasn't a writer because I wasn't getting, doing well with that. Yes, thank you in the chat, Anne Lamont. <laughs> um, because I, I do feel like, it took a while to kind of find the right kind of writing and read the right kind of writing that inspired me to get rid of that idea of what a writer was, that it was something very lofty and kind of find just the, the fun in the everyday. Beautiful. Lucia, when did yeah, you- Yeah, I, I don't really know if I really have a, a moment or, or anything. I think, I think instead of, yeah, a moment or a person, I certainly didn't have anybody ever tell me that I should be writing maybe still to this day, but, um, <laughs> but uh, I do feel like similar to Meg, I think that like once I started collaborating with people and feeling the like, oh yes, this, that, 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 this, this, then like the magic of that moment of being like, I can, we can be bouncing off of each other and it can get the idea to even a better place. The like, once I got a taste of that, I was like, oh shit, I'm in trouble because I can't do anything else now. Um, I think that there's there's something about like, honestly, like the community of, of that moment of that feels that that is like the high that I'm chasing like every day I wake up uh, of, of like, how can we make this better and better and better? And once we get there, it just feels so magical and honestly sorry but that is what hacks is about is about that <laughs> like finding the your people that you're like this i'm like the the excitement of like us together and like going off of each other is like the ultimate love language at least for me which is why i married my writing partner <laughs> but um, <laughs> you know like that that's like it, there's nothing like hotter and cooler and sexier and more fun than than that moment and so for me I guess the moment I, I realized I was a storyteller is when I got a first hit, my first hit. <laughs> and I don't know when I, that was, cause I probably had just had a first hit. It was probably stoned when it happened. So I don't remember, <laughs> but that moment I think probably was like, there's no going back. Ah, that is an excellent place for us to wrap up by saying thank you so much for all of you for making the time tonight. It's been a fabulous group of people listening. They've been so excited and so inspired. I want to thank you on behalf of the Stevens College MFA in TV and screenwriting. I want to thank you for all your work that has made me so excited to be watching television for so many years. So thank you all. Thank everybody who listened. We hope you have a great night and we appreciate your being with us. Bye, everybody. Hey guys, so nice to meet you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.